On the 2nd of June, 1953, the 27-year-old Princess Elizabeth became queen in a glittering pageant dating back almost a thousand years. During the ceremony in Westminster Abbey, the queen was anointed with holy oil to demonstrate her God-given right to rule. But this holiest of rituals concealed deep divisions within the House of Windsor. Successive monarchs had harnessed the coronation to set the tone for their reign. This ceremony was an opportunity to showcase a thoroughly modern monarchy. Prince Philip was all in favor of a fresh and dynamic style for a new reign but he was met with a wall of resistance. There were these sort of forces of tradition, and much, much older people really reigned up against him. Every time he tried to do something, he was slapped down by the old guard of the, the courtiers, even by uh, Queen Mary, who described him on one famous occasion as that damned fool Edinburgh. Unfortunately for Philip, the traditionalists included his new mother-in-law, who was determined that her daughter's reign would be a seamless continuation of her own. The Queen Mother was very protective of her dynasty, and nothing and no one was going to get in the way of that. The scene was set for conflict. In the build-up to the coronation, the two opposing sides, the old and the new, would clash repeatedly. The Queen was caught in the middle. This is London. It is with the greatest sorrow that we make the following announcement. It was announced from Sandringham at 10.45 today, February the 6th, 1952, that the king who retired to rest last night in his usual health passed peacefully away in his sleep earlier this morning. King George VI's premature death at the age of 56 was not only a dreadful loss for his family, for them it marked a traumatic change in their roles and status. The BBC offers profound sympathy to Her Majesty the Queen and the royal family. Elizabeth, aged only 25, was catapulted prematurely onto the throne. Her coronation would not only sanctify her role as monarch, it was to symbolize a new era in British history. There was a lot made of the prospect that this was going to be the beginning of a new Elizabethan age. Churchill made the point himself, and he referred back to the, 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 the genius of the Tudors and hoped that it was going to occur again. The coronation would show the world Britain was still a force to be reckoned with. It showed that a victorious nation had recovered from the Second World War, that peace and prosperity had returned. It also seemed to show that British power was intact. It was a pageant of empire. The stakes were high, and with so many expectations riding on the coronation, 16 months were given to plan and rehearse this event. But to choreograph the royal family's new roles would be an even more demanding task and the Queen Mother and Prince Philip found they were moving to very different rhythms. He was seen to be a new Prince Albert, a consort for the jet age. The way that he presented himself as a man of science, technology, industry, the future, was part of his own attempt to be taken seriously and to be absolutely at the forefront of how the monarchy was seen. But the Queen Mother saw no need for change and for Philip's jet age dynamism. She was very much a matriarch. She was determined that what she and her late husband had begun was going to continue throughout the 20th century and beyond. And that was a monarchy of tradition, stability, continuity and probity. The Queen Mother saw her daughter's coronation as a chance to celebrate this. Who organized the coronation and the way that the coronation was organized was all about maintaining tradition, to present an idea of seamless continuity over the centuries. 
And the main purpose was to get it as close as possible to the coronation of George VI. The Queen's father's coronation had been a deeply traditional display of majesty and archaic ritual. It boosted the confidence of the monarchy, badly shaken after Edward VIII had abandoned his throne to marry Wallace Simpson. The Queen Mother joined wholeheartedly in the effort to restore stability to the crown. Her anxious, stammering husband needed help with his public image, and she managed it brilliantly. The Queen Mother had been an enormous success as queen. She was charming, she was outgoing, she knew how to talk to people in a very relaxed kind of way. She was a commoner, but she had the magic touch. And people tended to fall in love with her, and I think she did an enormous amount to create the matriarchy which her daughter inherited. She was determined to safeguard the carefully managed image of the royal family that she had projected. On becoming queen, she had turned to London's top society couturier, Norman Hartnell, to rebrand her. And he created her signature look, exuberant layers of crinoline. The new look went on test on a state visit to the style capital of the world, Paris, in July 1938. Unfortunately, three weeks before the, the state visit was to take place, and it was the first state visit of their reign, uh, her mother died. Well, that normally meant court mourning for six months. Well, she couldn't really go to that great fashionable city in black. But um, Queen Mary had actually often worn white in widowhood, and white is also a colour of mourning, and so they interpreted that. And so um, Hartnell then ran her up this fantastic white wardrobe. Queen Elizabeth left London in black and emerged in Paris in white and dazzled them all like mad. Hartnell's designs made the Queen Mother a fashion sensation, the Jackie Kennedy of her day. But the new royal chemistry really began to fizz when the Queen Mother met the infamously gay photographer, Cecil Beaton. Cecil Beaton was summoned to Buckingham Palace to photograph Queen Elizabeth, and out came more versions of this white wardrobe. And of course, between the two of them, they created, in a way, this, this new image. What better hands could she have fallen into than the hands of Norman Hartnell and Cecil Beaton, both of whom had a, an immense flair and style. Flanked by these camp generals, the Queen Mother had rebranded the royal image. They had captured that elusive thing, a fairy tale queen with a human face. Now she would call on them to spin their magic for her daughter's coronation, even as she herself, at the age of 51, was forced to stand aside. It must have been upsetting to see all that terrific deference, etc., etc., all the power to her daughter and herself elbowed into the shadows. Deferring to her daughter was one thing. Dealing with her son-in-law's innovative views was quite another. He seemed to be somebody who could threaten the stability of the monarchy in the way that uh, King Edward VIII had done. And as the coronation drew closer, the new prince was about to make his presence felt. After the death of King George VI, the Queen Mother was determined that the royal family would continue the image she had created. Her daughter's coronation would display a unified royal family to a united country. But behind the scenes, there was no such cosy family. The Queen's husband, with his good looks and the width of modernity about him, was treated with suspicion by the establishment. Who was this young man, Prince Philip? Philip of Greece? Was he a real prince? Where were his parents, for example? His father had died in France during the war. His, his mother was sort of in Greece, but, but, but who were they? His sisters, well, hadn't they all married Germans and weren't some of those Germans Nazis? He was, to many people, a suspect character, the prince from nowhere. 
Philip's background didn't help him win the confidence of his mother-in-law. She felt that Philip was, with all these mysterious European connections, he wasn't a sound chap, he was, he was dangerous. I'm not sure he was really her sort of man. If you look at the friend she had, you know, I don't think he really was. Um, and this is perhaps a rather strong thing to say, but she was tremendously anti-German. Philip was perhaps not the Queen Mother's ideal son-in-law, but he had won her daughter's heart. He suddenly found himself at the center of a great ruling dynasty, and he wasn't the sort of person to take a back seat. I think that he felt that what he'd got was a billet for life, which was something that he had singularly lacked in his youth when he'd been, I mean, he had to wear hand-me-downs from Lord Mountbatten. He had, he, he'd really been very badly off. Now, at last, he had found a wife with all the money in the world, and he expected to benefit from this terrific position that he'd now got. At least for the first years of their lives together, it seemed that Philip was able to wear the trousers. His career was taking off in the Navy, and in 1949, he was posted to Malta as first lieutenant to the destroyer, HMS Chequers. When Prince Philip and the Queen, of course she wasn't, she was Princess Elizabeth then, lived in Malta, the sort of ordinary service life of a naval couple, it was probably the happiest, most normal period of their life. But this break from royal life was to be short-lived. In July 1951, Philip and Elizabeth were summoned back to London. The king was gravely ill. It was Elizabeth's duty to be by his side and Philip's to be by hers. When six months later the king died, Philip's much-loved naval career was also dealt a deathly blow. He'd always led a very independent private life in the Navy. Uh, he'd been to school here. And uh, I think that suddenly, from being sort of the Queen's husband and playing a quite a big role like that, he suddenly realized, you know, that there he was walking two steps behind her sort of thing, you know. He said, when the late King died, everything changed. Within weeks, the dusty machinery of state creaked into action to plan the coronation. Reassuringly for the Queen Mother, it was headed by the Duke of Norfolk, the man who had organized her husband's coronation. He was a very conservative man. For him, the coronation was all about maintaining tradition and continuity. And that was how the Duke of Norfolk wanted to keep it. When Philip asked the Archbishop of Canterbury how some features relevant to the world today could be introduced into the ceremony, he was brushed off. And this tyranny of tradition extended beyond the coronation and into every area of royal life. Philip and Elizabeth were even forced into an unwelcome house swap. After George VI's death, it was inevitable that the new royal couple, uh, Queen Elizabeth and, and Philip, would have to move into Buckingham Palace. This was something that Philip didn't want. He didn't want to leave Clarence House, which he'd spent a fortune on redecorating. It was all very nice and suited him. Prince Philip's idea was that the family should continue at Clarence House. The official business could be done from Buckingham Palace, but their home would continue to be down the mall at Clarence House. He produced a document setting out the reasons why this is the best way forward. His piece of paper was dismissed. The Queen was obviously influenced by Philip, but in the last resort, she had to do what her official advisers told her. And so, when Churchill said they must move into Buckingham Palace, she had to go along with this. Prince Philip's view counted for nothing. 
the Prime Minister's view went for everything. There was another problem. Buckingham Palace already had an occupant, the Queen Mother, and she was in no hurry to downshift to the mere four-storey mansion, Clarence House. I know it sounds strange to say it. She thought it was too small. We would now think it was the perfect size residence, but of course times have moved on. So Philip found himself reluctantly living with his mother-in-law, surrounded by her camp courtiers. I think it was difficult for Philip when they moved into Buckingham Palace because the, the Queen Mother was there, the Queen Sister was there, and he was surrounded by all these women, and he was a, a, a virile man's man of his own, and he didn't, uh, he didn't, um, he found this rather, a, I, I, I think he found this rather tiresome. Even the Queen's formidable grandmother, Queen Mary, was still alive and living down the Mall at Marlborough House. If this was hard to live with, the leaden pace of life at Buckingham Palace which had so suited the Queen Mother, was almost intolerable for Philip. When he got there, he found this fusty, old-fashioned setup, and he felt that what was necessary was to modernize the whole place. There were all sorts of people with vested interests in this, and people who had to light the candles, and people who had got to wear particular uniforms and appear at particular times. It was really rather absurd. So he was most impatient with this, and he was most impatient of all with Sir Alan Lassells, the Queen's private secretary, who was the personification of old fashions. And he very much looked down his nose at this brash young naval officer who would come in and try to turn the whole system on its head. If you wanted to send a message to another member of the family in Buckingham Palace, you summoned a footman and you gave him a handwritten note which he put on a salver and he walked half a mile to the other part of the palace and gave it to the other member of the family. Prince Philip said, this is ridiculous. You know, in the Navy, we have walkie-talkies. Why can't we have them in the palace? Well, of course, a certain sort of um, you know, palace bureaucrat was absolutely appalled at this idea. They'd always used footmen with selfers. So, you know, how could they possibly do anything else? Philip escaped the palace walls through a social life mixing with his type of people. He had had quite a colourful life before he was married, and it didn't take him long to resume the rather rackety existence um, that he had adopted as a young, licentious naval officer after Elizabeth and he got married. And certainly uh, when she was preoccupied with her royal duties, he tended to be off in rather, shall we say, unsuitable company. Amongst those deemed unsuitable was the society photographer Baron Naum. He had photographed the royal wedding and was to become a candidate to take the official coronation portrait. His rival would be the Queen Mother's favourite, Cecil Beaton. While Beaton was notoriously camp, Baron was an infamous philanderer. Well, it was uh, quite often we'd have to go and uh, wake Baron up. Several times I had to sort of go up and shout up the stairs and he'd roll out of bed and there's always some woman there. Prince Philip found him rather uh, fun, amusing. Quite often we uh, helped him with his parties. They were always uh, quite fun sort of parties and uh, various interesting friends would be there, pretty girls. And I think Prince Philip found him, as, in a way, a slight escape from the rigours of the palace. It was a testosterone fueled social scene and was populated by bohemian types. Amongst the actors, newspaper editors, artists and authors were David Niven and Peter Ustinov, the spy Kim Philby and the later infamous Stephen Ward. 
Baron even set up a regular gathering for Philip. They called themselves the Thursday Club. It was a luncheon club dedicated, I suppose, to the idea that weekends for lucky people started on Thursdays and you took Friday off from work, likewise Saturday and Sunday, and only started again on Monday. It was full of um, faintly raffish, faintly luge people letting off steam, you know, probably having slightly too much to drink, possibly telling slightly off-colour stories. And when he was with Baron at any of these parties, he... Uh, would be very relaxed and he'd enjoy the company. Of, I don't know what happened afterwards, anything, anything he might have done. These Soho nights were just a short escape. At home, Philip's efforts at reform were being blocked, even by the one person he might have expected to be an ally. Some marriages work because the people are very similar, some work because the people are very different. The Queen and Prince Philip are very different people. She sided with the old guard. She is a traditionalist. She followed in the footsteps of her father. So there is a tension there. She was the personification herself of duty, of obedience. She knew that this was what she was having to sacrifice her own satisfactions to, 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 to be what she was. And therefore, uh, there was inevitably a, 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 a good deal of friction with her husband. And his position wasn't made any easier by the presence in the palace of the formidable Queen Mother. One of the reasons Philip felt so frustrated by the court was that his mother-in-law was very much a power behind the throne. 